Chapter twenty eight of The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings, Chapter twenty eight Art and Nature now girls said mrs ellis gray to her daughters here is a letter from george summers and he is to be down here next week so i give you fair warning warning said fanny gray looking up from her embroidery what do you mean by that mamma now that's just you fanny said the elder sister laughing you dear little simplicity you can never understand anything unless it is stated as definitely as the multiplication table but we need no warning in the case of cousin george i'm sure said fanny cousin george to be sure do you hear the little innocent said isabella the second sister i suppose fanny you never heard that he had been visiting all the courts of europe seeing all the fine women stone picture and real that are to be found such an amateur and connoisseur besides having received a fortune of a million or so said emma i dare say now fanny you thought he was coming home to make dandelion chains and play with button balls as he used to do when he was a little boy fanny will never take the world as it is said mrs gray i do believe she will be a child as long as she lives mrs gray said this as if she were sighing over some radical defect in the mind of her daughter and the delicate cheek of fanny showed a tint somewhat deeper as she spoke and she went on with her embroidery in silence mrs gray had been left by the death of her husband sole guardian of the three girls whose names have appeared on the page she was an active busy ambitious woman one of the sort for whom nothing is ever finished enough or perfect enough without a few touches and dashes and emendations and as such people always make a mighty affair of education mrs gray had made it a life's enterprise to order adjust and settle the character of her daughters and when we use the word character as mrs gray understood it we mean it to include both face figure dress accomplishments as well as those more unessential items mind and heart mrs gray had determined that her daughters should be something altogether out of the common way and accordingly she had conducted the training of the two eldest with such zeal and effect that every trace of an original character was thoroughly educated out of them all their opinions feelings words and actions instead of gushing naturally from their hearts were according to the most approved authority diligently compared and revised emma the eldest was an imposing showy girl of some considerable talent and she had been assiduously trained to make a sensation as a woman of ability and intellect her mind had been filled with information on all sorts of subjects much faster than she had power to digest or employ it and the standards which her ambitious mother had set for her being rather above the range of her abilities there was a constant sensation of effort in her keeping up to it in hearing her talk you were constantly reminded i am a woman of intellect i am entirely above the ordinary level of women and on all subjects she was so anxiously and laboriously well and circumstantially informed that it was enough to make one's head ache to hear her talk isabella the second daughter was par excellence a beauty a tall sparkling cleopatra-looking girl whose rich colour dazzling eyes and superb figure might have bid defiance to art to furnish an extra charm nevertheless each grace had been as indefatigably drilled and manoeuvred as the members of an artillery company eyes lips eyelashes all had their lesson and every motion of her sculptured limbs every intonation of her silvery voice had been studied considered and corrected till even her fastidious mother could discern nothing that was wanting then were added all the graces of belle letters all the approved rules of being delighted with music painting and poetry and last of all came the tour of the continent travelling being generally considered a sort of pumice stone for rubbing down the varnish and giving the very last touch to character 
during the time that all this was going on miss fanny whom we now declare our heroine had been growing up in the quietude of her mother's country seat and growing as girls are apt to much faster than her mother imagined she was a fair slender girl with a purity and simplicity of appearance which if it be not in itself beauty had all the best effect of beauty in interesting and engaging the heart she looked not so much beautiful as lovable her character was in precise correspondence with her appearance its first and chief element was feeling and to this add fancy fervour taste enthusiasm almost to the point of genius and just common sense enough to keep them all in order and you will have a very good idea of the mind of fanny gray delightfully passed the days with fanny during the absence of her mother while without thought of rule or compass she sang her own songs painted flowers and sketched landscapes from nature visited sociably all over the village where she was a great favorite ran about through the fields over fences or in the woods with her little cottage bonnet and above all built her own little castles in the air without anybody to help pull them down which we think about the happiest circumstance in her situation but affairs wore a very different aspect when mrs gray with her daughters returned from europe as full of foreign tastes and notions as people of an artificial character generally do return poor fanny was deluged with a torrent of new ideas she heard of styles of appearance and styles of beauty styles of manner and styles of conversation this that and the other air a general effect and a particular effect and a four hundred and fifty ways of producing an impression in short it seemed to her that people ought to be of wonderful consequence to have so many things to think and to say about the how and why of every word and action mrs gray who had no manner of doubt of her own ability to make over a character undertook the point with fanny as systematically as one would undertake to make over an old dress poor fanny who had an unconquerable aversion to trying on dresses or settling points in millinery went through with the most exemplary meekness an entire transformation as to all externals but when mrs gray set herself at work upon her mind and tastes and opinions the matter became somewhat more serious for the buoyant feeling and fanciful elements of her character were as incapable of being arranged according to rule as the sparkling water-drops are of being strung into necklaces and earrings or the gay clouds of being made into artificial flowers some warm natural desire or taste of her own was for ever interfering with her mother's regime some obstinate little fannyism would always put up its head in defiance of received custom and as her mother and sisters pathetically remarked do what you would with her she would always come out herself after all after trying laboriously to conform to the pattern which was daily set before her she came at last to the conclusion that some natural inferiority must forever prevent her from aspiring to accomplish anything in that way if i can't be what my mother wishes i'll at least be myself said she one day to her sisters for if i try to alter i shall neither be myself nor anybody else and on the whole her mother and sisters came to the same conclusion and in truth they found it a very convenient thing to have one in the family who was not studying effect or aspiring to be anything in particular it was very agreeable to mrs gray to have a daughter to sit with her when she had the sick headache while the other girls were entertaining company in the drawing-room below it was very convenient to her sisters to have some one whose dress took so little time that she had always a head and a pair of hands at their disposal in case of any toilet emergency then she was always loving and affectionate entirely willing to be out-talked and outshone on every occasion and that was another advantage as to isabella and emma the sensation that they made in society was enough to have gratified a dozen ordinary belles all that they said and did and wore was instant and unquestionable precedent 
and young gentlemen all starch and perfume twirled their laced pocket handkerchiefs and declared on their honour that they knew not which was the most overcoming the genius and wit of miss emma or the bright eyes of miss isabella though it was an agreed point that between them both not a heart in the gay world remained in its owner's possession a thing which might have a serious sound to one who did not know the character of these articles often the most trifling item in the inventory of worldly possessions and all this while all that was said of our heroine was something in this way i believe there is another sister is there not yes there is a quiet little blue-eyed lady who never has a word to say for herself quite amiable i am told now it was not a fact that miss fanny never had a word to say for herself if people had seen her on a visit at any one of the houses along the little green street of her native village they might have learned that her tongue could go fast enough but in lighted drawing-rooms and among buzzing voices and surrounded by people who were always saying things because such things were proper to be said fanny was always dizzy and puzzled and unready and for fear that she would say something she should not she concluded to say nothing at all nevertheless she made good use of her eyes and found a very quiet amusement in looking on to see how other people conducted matters well mr george summers is actually arrived at mrs gray's country seat and there he sits with miss isabella in the deep recess of that window where the white roses are peeping in so modestly to be sure thought fanny to herself as she quickly surveyed him looming up through the shade of a pair of magnificent whiskers and heard him passing the shuttlecock of compliment back and forth with the most assured and practised air in the world to be sure i was a child in imagining that i should see cousin george summers i'm sure this magnificent young gentleman full of all utterance and knowledge is not the cousin that i used to feel so easy with no indeed and fanny gave a half sigh and then went out into the garden to water her geranium for some days mr summers seemed to feel put upon his reputation to sustain the character of gallant savant connoisseur etc which every one who makes the tour of the continent is expected to bring home as a matter of course for there is seldom a young gentleman who knows he has qualifications in this line who can resist the temptation of showing what he can do accordingly he discussed tragedies and reviews and ancient and modern customs with miss emma and with miss isabella retouched her drawings and exhibited his own sported the most choice and recherche style of compliment at every turn and in short flattered himself perhaps justly that he was playing the irresistible in a manner quite equal to that of his fair cousins now all this while miss fanny was mistaken in one point for mr george summers though an exceedingly fine gentleman had after all quite a substratum of reality about him of real heart real feeling and real opinion of his own and the consequence was that when tired of the effort of conversing he really longed to find some one to talk to and in this mood he one evening strolled into the library leaving the gay party in the drawing-room to themselves miss fanny was there quite intent on a book of selections from the old english poets really miss fanny said mr summers you are very sparing of the favour of your company to us this evening oh i presume my company is not much missed said fanny with a smile you must have a poor opinion of our taste then said mr summers come come mr summers replied fanny you forget the person you are talking to it is not at all necessary for you to compliment me nobody ever does so you may feel relieved of that trouble nobody ever does miss fanny pray how is that because i am not the sort of person to say such things to and pray what sort of person ought one to be in order to have such things said replied mr summers why like sister isabella or like emma you understand i am a sort of little nobody if any one wastes fine words on me i never know what to make of them and pray what must one say to you said mr summers quite amused why what they really think and really feel and i am always puzzled by anything else 
accordingly about a half an hour afterwards you might have seen the much admired mr summers once more transformed into the cousin george and he and fanny engaged in a very interesting tete-a-tete about old times and things now you may skip across a fortnight from this evening and then look in at the same old library just as the setting sun is looking in at its western window and you will see fanny sitting back a little in the shadow with one straggling ray of light illuminating her pure childish face and she is looking up at mr george summers as if in some sudden perplexity and dear me if we are not mistaken our young gentleman is blushing why cousin george says the lady what do you mean i thought i spoke plainly enough fanny replied cousin george in a tone that might have made the matter plain enough to be sure fanny laughed outright and the gentleman looked terribly serious indeed now don't be angry said she as he turned away with a vexed and mortified air indeed now i can't help laughing it seems to me so odd what will they all think of you it's of no consequence to me what they think said mr summers i think fanny if you had the heart i gave you credit for you might have seen my feelings before now now do sit down my dear cousin said fanny earnestly drawing him into a chair and tell me how could i poor little miss fanny nobody how could i have thought any such thing with such sisters as i have i did think that you liked me that you knew more of my real feelings than mamma and sisters but that you should that you ever could why i am astonished that you did not fall in love with isabella that would have met your feelings then said george earnestly and looking as if he would have looked through her eyes soul and all no no indeed she said turning away her head but added she quickly you'll lose all your credit for good taste now tell me seriously what do you like me for well then fanny i can give you the best reason i like you for being a real sincere natural girl for being simple in your tastes and simple in your appearance and simple in your manners and for having heart enough left as i hope to love plain george summers with all his faults and not mr summers's reputation or mr summers's establishment well this is all very reasonable to me of course said fanny but it will be so much greek to poor mamma i dare say your mother could never understand how seeing the very acme of cultivation in all countries should have really made my eyes ache and long for something as simple as green grass or pure water to rest them on i came down here to find it among my cousins and i found in your sisters only just such women as i have seen and admired all over europe till i was tired of admiring your mother has achieved what she aimed at perfectly i know of no circle that could produce higher specimens but it is all art triumphant art after all and i have so strong a current of natural feeling running through my heart that i could never be happy except with a fresh simple impulsive character like me you're going to say said fanny laughing well i'll admit that you are right it would be a pity that you should not have one vote at least end of chapter twenty eight art and nature chapter twenty nine of the may flower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings Chapter 29 Children A little child shall lead them. One cold market morning, I looked into a milliner's shop, and there I saw a hale, hearty, well-browned young fellow from the country with his long cart whip and lion shag coat holding up some little matter and turning it about on his great fist and what do you suppose it was a baby's bonnet a little soft blue satin hood with the swan's down border white as the new fallen snow with a frill of rich blonde around the edge by his side stood a very pretty woman 
holding with no small pride the baby for evidently it was the baby any one could read that fact in every glance as they looked at each other and then at the large unconscious eyes and fat dimpled cheeks of the little one it was evident that neither of them had ever seen a baby like that before but really mary said the young man isn't three dollars very high mary very prudently said nothing but taking the little bonnet tied it on the little head and held up the baby the man looked and without another word down went the three dollars all the avails of last week's butter and as they walked out of the shop it is hard to say which looked the most delighted with the bargain ah thought i a little child shall lead them another day as i was passing a carriage factory along one of our principal back streets i saw a young mechanic at work on a wheel the rough body of a carriage stood beside him and there wrapped up snugly all hooded and cloaked sat a little dark-eyed girl about a year old playing with a great shaggy dog as i stopped the man looked up from his work and turned admiringly towards his little companion as much as to say see what i have got here yes thought i and if the little lady ever gets a glance from admiring swains as sincere as that she will be lucky ah these children little witches pretty even in all their faults and absurdities see for example yonder little fellow in a naughty fit he has shaken his long curls over his deep blue eyes the fair brow is bent in a frown the rose-leaf lip is pursed up in infinite defiance and the white shoulder thrust angrily forward can any but a child look so pretty even in its naughtiness then comes the instant change flashing smiles and tears as the good comes back all in a rush and you are overwhelmed with protestations promises and kisses they are irresistible too these little ones they pull away the scholar's pin tumble about his paper make somersets over his books and what can he do they tear up newspapers litter the carpets break pull and upset and then jabber unheard of english in self-defence and what can you do for yourself if i had a child says the precise man you should see he does have a child and his child tears up his papers tumbles over his things and pulls his nose like all other children and what has the precise man to say for himself nothing he is like everybody else a little child shall lead him the hardened heart of the worldly man is unlocked by the guileless tones and simple caresses of his son but he repays it in time by imparting to his boy all the crooked tricks and callous maxims which have undone himself go to the jail to the penitentiary and find there the wretch most sullen brutal and hardened then look at your infant son such as he is to you such to some mother was this man that hard hand was soft and delicate that rough voice was tender and lisping fond eyes followed him as he played and he was rocked and cradled as something holy there was a time when his heart soft and unworn might have opened to his questionings of god and jesus and been sealed with the seal of heaven but harsh hands seized it fierce goblin liniments were impressed upon it and all is over with him for ever so if the tender weeping child is made the callous heartless man of the all-believing child the sneering skeptic of the beautiful and modest the shameless and abandoned and this is what the world does for the little one there was a time when the divine one stood on earth and little children sought to draw near to him but harsh human beings stood between him and them forbidding their approach ah has it not always been so do not even we with our hard and unsubdued feelings our worldly and unspiritual habits and maxims stand like a dark screen between our little child and its saviour and keep even from the choice bud of our hearts the sweet radiance which might unfold it for paradise suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not is still the voice of the son of god but the cold world still closes around and forbids when of old disciples would question their lord of the higher mysteries of his kingdom he took a little child and set him in the midst as a sign of him who should be greatest in heaven that gentle teacher remains still to us by every hearth and fireside jesus still sets the little child in the midst of us wouldst thou know o parent what is that faith which unlocks heaven 
go not to wrangling polemics or creeds and forms of theology but draw to thy bosom thy little one and read in that clear trusting eye the lesson of eternal life be only to thy god as thy child is to thee and all is done blessed shall thou be indeed when a little child shall lead thee end of chapter twenty nine children chapter thirty of the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis the mayflower and miscellaneous writings by harriet beecher stowe chapter thirty how to make friends with mammon it was four o'clock in the afternoon of a dull winter day that mr h sat in his counting-room the sun had nearly gone down and in fact it was already twilight beneath the shadows of the tall dusky stores and the close crooked streets of that quarter of boston hardly light enough struggled through the dusky panes of the counting-house for him to read the entries in a much-thumbed memorandum-book which he held in his hand a small thin boy with a pale face and anxious expression significant of delicacy of constitution and a too early acquaintance with want and sorrow was standing by him earnestly watching his motions ah yes my boy said mr h as he at last shut up the memorandum book yes i've got the place now i'm apt to be forgetful about these things come now let's go how is it haven't you brought the basket no sir said the boy timidly the grocer said he'd let mother have a quarter for it and she thought she'd sell it that's bad said mr h as he went on tying his throat with a long comforter of some yards in extent and as he continued this operation he abstractedly repeated that's bad that's bad till the poor little boy looked quite dismayed and began to think that somehow his mother had been dreadfully out of the way she didn't want to send for help so long as she had anything she could sell said the little boy in a deprecating tone oh yes quite right said mr h taking from a pigeon-hole in the desk a large pocket-book and beginning to turn it over and as before abstractedly repeating quite right quite right till the little boy became reassured and began to think although he didn't know why that his mother had done something quite meritorious well said mr h after he had taken several bills from the pocket-book and transferred them to a wallet which he put into his pocket now we're ready my boy but first he stopped to lock up his desk and then he said abstractedly to himself i wonder if i hadn't better take a few tracks now it is to be confessed that this mr h whom we have introduced to our reader was in his own way quite an oddity he had a number of singular little penchants and peculiarities quite his own such as a passion for poking about among dark alleys at all sorts of seasonable and unseasonable hours fishing out troops of dirty neglected children and fussing about generally in the community till he could get them into schools or otherwise provided for he always had in his pocket-book a note of some dozen poor widows who wanted tea sugar candles or other things such as poor widows always will be wanting 
and then he had a most extraordinary talent for finding out all the six strangers that lay in out-of-the-way upper rooms in hotels who everybody knows have no business to get sick in such places unless they have money enough to pay their expenses which they never do besides this all mr h s kinsmen and cousins to the third fourth and fortieth remove were always writing him letters which among other pleasing items generally contained the intelligence that a few hundred dollars were just then exceedingly necessary to save them from utter ruin and they knew of nobody else to whom to look for it and then mr h was up to his throat in subscriptions to every charitable society that ever was made or imagined had a hand in building all the churches within a hundred miles occasionally gave four or five thousand dollars to a college offered to be one of six to raise ten thousand dollars for some benevolent purpose and when four of the six backed out quietly paid the balance himself and said no more about it another of his innocent fancies was to keep always about him any quantity of tracts and good books little and big for children and grown-up people which he generally diffused in a kind of gentle shower about him wherever he moved so great was his monomania for benevolence that it could not at all confine itself to the streets of boston the circle of his relatives or even the united states of america mr h was fully posted up in the affairs of india burma china and all those odd out-of-the-way places which no sensible man ever thinks of with any interest unless he can make some money there and money it is to be confessed mr h didn't make there though he spent an abundance for getting up printing presses in ceylon for chinese type for boxes of clothing and what not to be sent to the sandwich islands for school books for the greeks and all other nonsense of that sort mr h was without a parallel no wonder his rich brother merchants sometimes thought him something of a bore since his heart being full of all these matters he was rather apt to talk about them and sometimes to endeavour to draw them into fellowship to an extent that was not to be thought of so it came to pass often that though mr h was a thriving business man with some ten thousand a year he often wore a pretty threadbare coat the seams whereof would be trimmed with lines of white and he would sometimes need several pretty plain hints on the subject of a new hat before he would think he could afford one now it is to be confessed the world is not always grateful to those who thus devote themselves to its interests and mr h had as much occasion to know this as any other man people got so used to his giving that his bounty became as common and as necessary as that of a higher benefactor who maketh his son to rise upon the evil and the good and sendeth rain upon the just and the unjust and so it came to pass that people took them as they do the sunshine and the rain quite as matters of course not thinking much about them when they came but particularly apt to scold when they did not come but mr h never cared for that he did not give for gratitude he did not give for thanks nor to have his name published in the papers as one of six who had given fifty thousand to do so and so but he gave because it was in him to give and we all know that it is an old rule in medicine as well as morals that what is in a man must be brought out 
then again he had heard it reported that there had been one of distinguished authority who had expressed the opinion that it was more blessed to give than to receive and he very much believed it believed it because the one who said it must have known since for man's sake he once gave away all and so when some thriftless distant relation whose debts he had paid a dozen times over gave him an overhauling on the subject of liberality and seemed inclined to take him by the throat for further charity he calmed himself down by a chapter or two from the new testament and half a dozen hymns and then sent him a good brotherly letter of admonition and counsel with a bank-note to enforce it and when some querulous old woman who had a tenement of him rent free for three or four years sent him word that if he didn't send and mend the water-pipes she would move right out he sent and mended them people said that he was foolish and that it didn't do any good to do for ungrateful people but mr h knew that it did him good he loved to do it and he thought also on some words that ran to this effect do good and lend hoping for nothing again he literally hoped for nothing again in the way of reward either in this world or in heaven beyond the present pleasure of the deed for he had abundant occasion to see how favours are forgotten in this world and as for another he had in his own soul a standard of benevolence so high so pure so ethereal that but one of mortal birth ever reached it he felt that do what he might he fell ever so far below the life of that spotless one that his crown in heaven must come to him at last not as a reward but as a free eternal gift but all this while our friend and his little companion have been pattering along the wet streets in the rain and sleet of a bitter cold evening till they stopped before a grocery here a large cross-handled basket was first bought and then filled with sundry packages of tea sugar candles soap starch and various other matters a barrel of flour was ordered to be sent after him on a dray mr h next stopped at a dry goods store and bought a pair of blankets with which he loaded down the boy who was happy enough to be so loaded and then turning gradually from the more frequented streets the two were soon lost to view in one of the dimmest alleys of the city the cheerful fire was blazing in his parlour as returned from his long wet walk he was sitting by it with his feet comfortably encased in slippers the astral was burning brightly on the centre table and a group of children were around it studying their lessons papa said a little boy what does this verse mean it's in my sunday school lesson make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations you ought to have asked your teacher my son but he said he didn't know exactly what it meant he wanted me to look this week and see if i could find out mr h s standing resource in all exegetical difficulties was dr scott's family bible therefore he now got up and putting on his spectacles walked to the glass bookcase and took down a volume of that worthy commentator and opening it read aloud the whole exposition of the passage together with the practical reflections upon it and by the time he had done he found his young auditor fast asleep in his chair mother said he this child plays too hard he can't keep his eyes open evenings it's time he was in bed 
i wasn't asleep pa said master henry starting up with that air of injured innocence with which gentlemen of his age generally treat an imputation of this kind then can you tell me now what the passage means that i have been reading to you there's so much of it said henry hopelessly i wish you'd just tell me in short order father oh read it for yourself said mr h as he pushed the book towards the boy for it was to be confessed that he perceived at this moment that he had not himself received any particularly luminous impression though of course he thought it was owing to his own want of comprehension mr h leaned back in his rocking-chair and on his own private account began to speculate a little as to what he really should think the verse might mean supposing he were at all competent to decide upon it make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness says he that's money very clearly how am i to make friends with it or of it receive me into everlasting habitations that's a singular kind of expression i wonder what it means dr scott makes some very good remarks about it but somehow i'm not exactly clear it must be remarked that this was not an uncommon result of mr h s critical investigations in this quarter well thoughts will wander and as he lay with his head on the back of his rocking-chair and his eyes fixed on the flickering blaze of the coal visions of his wet tramp in the city and of the lonely garret he had been visiting and of the poor woman with the pale discouraged face to whom he had carried warmth and comfort all blended themselves together he felt too a little indefinite creeping chill and some uneasy sensations in his head like a commencing cold for he was not a strong man and it is probable his long wet walk was likely to cause him some inconvenience in this way at last he was fast asleep nodding in his chair he dreamed that he was very sick in bed that the doctor came and went and that he grew sicker and sicker he was going to die he saw his wife sitting weeping by his pillow his children standing by with pale and frightened faces all things in his room began to swim and waver and fade and voices that called his name and sobs and lamentations that rose around him seemed far off and distant in his ear oh eternity eternity i am going i am going he thought and in that hour strange to tell not one of all his good deeds seemed good enough to lean on all bore some taint or tinge to his purified eye of mortal selfishness and seemed unholy before the all-pure i am going he thought there is no time to stay no time to alter to balance accounts and i know not what i am but i know o oh jesus what thou art i have trusted in thee and shall never be confounded and with that last breath of prayer earth was past a soft and solemn breathing as of music awakened him as an infant child not yet fully awake hears the holy warblings of his mother's hymn and smiles half conscious so the heaven-born became aware of sweet voices and loving faces around him ere yet he fully woke to the new immortal life ah oh, he has come at last how long we have waited for him here he is among us now for ever welcome welcome said the voices who shall speak the joy of that latest birth the birth from death to life 
the sweet calm inbreathing consciousness of purity and rest the certainty that all sin all weakness and error are at last gone forever the deep immortal rapture of repose felt to be but begun never to end so the eyes of the heaven-born opened on the new heaven and the new earth and wondered at the crowd of loving faces that thronged about him fair godlike forms of beauty such as earth never knew pressed round him with blessings thanks and welcome the man spoke not but he wondered in his heart who they were and whence it came that they knew him and as soon as the inquiry formed itself in his soul it was read at once by his heavenly friends i said one bright spirit was a poor boy whom you found in the streets you sought me out you sent me to school you watched over me and led me to the house of god and now here i am and we said other voices are other neglected children whom you redeemed we also thank you and i said another was a lost helpless girl sold to sin and shame nobody thought i could be saved everybody passed me by till you came you built a home a refuge for such poor wretches as i and there i and many like me heard of jesus and here we are and i said another was once a clerk in your store i came to the city innocent but i was betrayed by the tempter i forgot my mother and my mother's god i went to the gaming table and the theatre and at last i robbed your drawer you might have justly cast me off but you bore with me you watched over me you saved me i am here through you this day and i said another was a poor slave girl doomed to be sold on the auction block to a life of infamy and the ruin of soul and body had you not been willing to give so largely for my ransom no one had thought to buy me you stimulated others to give and i was redeemed i lived a christian mother to bring my children up for christ they are all here with me to bless you this day and their children on earth and their children's children are growing up to bless you and i said another was an unbeliever in the pride of my intellect i thought i could demonstrate the absurdity of christianity i thought i could answer the argument from miracles and prophecy but your patient self-denying life was an argument i never could answer when i saw you spending all your time and all your money in efforts for your fellow-men undiscouraged by ingratitude and careless of praise then i thought there is something divine in that man's life and that thought brought me here the man looked around on the gathering congregation and he saw that there was no one whom he had drawn heavenward that had not also drawn thither myriads of others in his lifetime he had been scattering seeds of good around from hour to hour almost unconsciously and now he saw every seed springing up into a widening forest of immortal beauty and glory it seemed to him that there was to be no end of the numbers that flocked to claim him as their long-expected soul friend his heart was full and his face became as that of an angel as he looked up to one who seemed nearer than all and said this is thy love for me unworthy o jesus of thee and to thee and through thee are all things amen amen as with course of many waters and mighty thunderings the sound swept onward and died far off in chiming echoes among the distant stars and the man awoke
End of chapter 30「Chapter Thirty One of the Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter Thirty One A Scene in Jerusalem. It is now nearly noon the busiest and most bustling hour of the day yet the streets of the holy city seem deserted and silent as the grave the artisan has left his bench the merchant his merchandise the throngs of returned wanderers which this great national festival has brought up from every land of the earth and which have been for the last week carrying life and motion through every street seem suddenly to have disappeared here and there solitary footfalls like the last pattering raindrops after a shower awaken the echoes of the streets and here and there some lonely woman looks from the housetop with anxious and agitated face as if she would discern something in the far distance alone or almost alone a few remaining priests move like white-winged solitary birds over the gorgeous pavements of the temple and as they mechanically conduct the ministrations of the day, cast significant glances on each other, and pause here and there to converse in anxious whispers. And there is one voice which they have often heard beneath those arches, a voice which ever bore in it a mysterious and thrilling charm, which they know will be hushed today. Chief priest, scribe, and doctor, have all gone out in the death procession after him. And these few remaining ones, far from the excitement of the crowd, are busied in calm and sacred duties, find voices of anxious questioning arising from the depths of their own souls. What if this indeed were the Christ? But pass we on out of the city, and what a surging tide of life and motion meets the eye, as if all nations under heaven had dashed their waves of population on this Judean shore. A noisy, wrathful, tempestuous mob, billow on billow, waver and rally round some central object which it conceals from view. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and Egypt, strangers of Rome, Cretes and Arabians, Jew and proselyte, convoked from the ends of the earth, throng in agitated concourse one on another, one theme in every face, on every tongue, one name in every variety of accent and dialect, passing from lip to lip. Jesus of Nazareth. Look on that man, the center and cause of all this outburst. He stands there alone. The cross is ready, it lies beneath his feet. The rough hand of a brutal soldier has seized his robe to tear it from him. Another with stalwart arm is boring the holes, gazing upward the while with a face of stupid unconcern. There on the ground lie the hammer and the nails. The hour, the moment of doom has come. Look on this man as upward with deep sorrowing eyes he gazes towards heaven hears he the roar of the mob feels he the rough hand on his garment nay he sees not feels not from all the rage and tumult of the hour he is rapt away a sorrow deeper more absorbing more unearthly seems to possess him as upward with long gaze he looks to that heaven never before closed to his prayer to that god never before to him invisible that mournful heaven-searching glance in its lonely anguish says but one thing lo i come to do thy will o god through a life of sorrow the realized love of his father has shone like a precious and beautiful talisman in his bosom but now, when desolation and anguish have come upon him as a whirlwind, this last star has gone out in the darkness. 
and jesus deserted by man and god stands there alone alone no for undaunted by the cruel mob fearless in the strength of mortal anguish helpless yet undismayed stands the one blessed among women the royal daughter of a noble line the priestess to whose care was entrusted this spotless sacrifice she and her son last of a race of kings stand there despised rejected and disavowed by their nation to accomplish dread words of prophecy which have swept down for far ages to this hour strange it is in this dark scene to see the likeness between mother and son deepening in every line of those faces as they stand thus thrown out by the dark background of rage and hate which like a storm cloud lowers around the same rapt absorbed calm intensity of anguish in both mother and son save only that while he gazes upward towards god she with like fervor gazes on him what to her is the deriding mob the coarse taunt the brutal abuse of it all she hears she feels nothing she sinks not faints not weeps not her whole being concentrates in the will to suffer by and with him to the last other hearts there are that beat for him others that press in to the doomed circle and own him amid the scorn of thousands there may you see the clasped hands and upraised eyes of a magdalen the pale and steady resolve of john the weeping company of women who bewailed and lamented him but none dare press so near or seem so identical with him in his sufferings as this mother and as we gaze on these two in human form surrounded by other human forms how strange the contrast how is it possible that human features and human lineaments essentially alike can be wrought into such heaven-wide contrast man is he who stands there lofty and spotless in bleeding patience men also are those brutal soldiers alike stupidly ready at the word of command to drive the nail through quivering flesh or insensate wood men are those scowling priests and infuriate pharisees men also the shifting figures of careless rabble who shout and curse without knowing why no visible glory shines round that head yet how spite of every defilement cast upon him by the vulgar rabble seems that form to be glorified what light is that in those eyes what mournful beauty in that face what solemn mysterious sacredness investing the whole form constraining from us the exclamation surely this is the son of god man's voice is breathing vulgar taunt and jeer he saved others himself he cannot save he trusted in god let him deliver him if he will have him and man's also clear sweet unearthly pierces that storm mob saying father forgive them they know not what they do but we draw the veil in reverence it is not ours to picture what the sun refused to shine upon and the earth shook to behold little thought those weeping women that stricken disciple that heartbroken mother how on some future day that cross emblem to them of deepest infamy should blaze in the eyes of all nations symbol of triumph and hope glittering on gorgeous fanes embroidered on regal banners associated with all that is revered and powerful on earth the roman ensign waved on that mournful day symbol of highest earthly power is a thing mouldered and forgotten and over all the high palaces of old rome herself stands that mystical cross no longer speaking of earthly anguish and despair but of heavenly glory honor and immortality theologians have endlessly disputed and philosophized on this great fact of atonement the bible tells only that this tragic event was the essential point without which our salvation could never have been secured 
but where lay the necessity they do not say what was that dread strait that either the divine one must thus suffer or man be lost who knoweth to this question answer a thousand voices with each a different solution urged with equal confidence each solution to its framer as certain and sacred as the dread fact it explains yet every one perhaps unsatisfactory to the deep questioning soul the bible as it always does gives on this point not definitions or distinct outlines but images images which lose all their glory and beauty if seized by the harsh hands of metaphysical analysis but inexpressibly affecting to the unlettered human heart which softens in gazing on their mournful and mysterious beauty christ is called our sacrifice our passover our atoning high priest and he himself while holding in his hands the emblem cup says it is my blood shed for many for the remission of sins let us reason on it as we will this story of the cross presented without explanation in the simple metaphor of the bible has produced an effect on human nature wholly unaccountable in every age and clime with every variety of habit thought and feeling from the cannibals of new zealand and madagascar to the most enlightened and scientific minds in christendom one feeling essentially homogeneous in its character and results has arisen in the view of the cross there is something in it that strikes one of the great nerves of simple unsophisticated humanity and meets its wants as nothing else will ages ago paul declared to philosophizing greek and scornful romans that he was not ashamed of this gospel and alleged for his reason this very adaptedness to humanity a priori many would have said that paul should have told of christ living christ preaching christ working miracles not omitting also the pathetic history of how he sealed all with his blood but paul declared that he determined to know nothing else but christ crucified he said it was a stumbling block to the jew an absurdity to the greek yet he was none the less positive in his course true there was many then as now who looked on with the most philosophical and cultivated indifference the courtly festus as he settled his purple tunic declared that he could make nothing of the matter only a dispute about one jesus who was dead of whom paul affirmed to be alive and perchance some athenian as he reclined on his ivory couch at dinner after the sermon on mars hill may have disposed of the matter very summarily and passed on to criticisms of samian wine and marble vases yet in spite of their disbelief this story of christ has outlived them their age and nation and it is to this hour as fresh in human hearts as if it were just published this one jesus which was dead and which paul affirmed to be alive is nominally at least the object of religious homage in all the more cultivated portions of the globe and to hearts scattered through all regions of the earth this same jesus is now a sacred and living name dearer than all household sounds all ties of blood all sweetest and nearest affections of humanity i am ready not only to be bound but also to die for the name of the lord jesus are the words that have found an echo in the bosoms of thousands in every age since then that would if need were find no less echo in thousands now considering christ as a man and his death as mere pathetic story considering him as one of the great martyrs for truth who sealed it with his blood this result is wholly unaccountable other martyrs have died bravely and tenderly in their last hours bearing witness of the godlike that is in man but whoso remembers them whoso loves them to whom is any one of them a living presence a life in all yet so thousands look on jesus at this hour nay it is because this story strikes home to every human bosom as an individual concern a thrilling voice speaks from this scene of anguish to every human bosom this is thy saviour thy sin hath done this it is the appropriative words thine and mine 
which make this history different from any other history it was for me is the thought which has pierced the apathy of the greenlander and kindled the stolid clay of the hottentot and no human bosom has ever been found so low so lost so guilty so despairing that this truth once received has not had power to redeem regenerate and disenthrall christ so presented becomes to every human being a friend nearer than the mother who bore him and the more degraded the more helpless and polluted is the nature the stronger comes on the living reaction if this belief is really and vividly enkindled with it but take away this appropriative individual element and this legend of jesus death has no more power than any other he is to us no more than washington or socrates or howard and where is there not a touchstone to try every theory of atonement whatever makes a man feel that he is only a spectator an uninterested judge in this matter is surely astray from the idea of the bible whatever makes him feel that his sins have done this deed that he is bound soul and body to this deliverer though it may be in many points philosophically erroneous cannot go far astray if we could tell the number of stars and call them forth by name then perhaps might we solve all the mystic symbols by which the bible has foreshadowed forth the far-lying necessities and reachings forth of this event among the principalities and powers and in ages to come but he who knows nothing of all this who shall so present the atonement as to bind and affiance human souls indissolubly to their redeemer does all that could be done by the highest and most perfect knowledge the great object is accomplished when the soul rapt inspired feels the deep resolve remember thee yea from the table of my memory i'll wipe away all trivial fond records all saws of books all forms all pressures past that youth and observation copied there and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain unmixed with baser matter end of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of the Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe chapter thirty two the old meeting house sketch from the notebook of an old gentleman never shall i forget the dignity and sense of importance which swelled my mind when i was first pronounced old enough to go to meeting that eventful sunday i was up long before day and even took my sabbath suit to the window to ascertain by the first light that it actually was there just as it looked the night before with what complacency did i view myself completely dressed how did i count over the rows of yellow gilt buttons on my coat how my good mother grandmother and aunts fussed and twitched and pulled to make everything set up and set down just in the proper place how my clean starched white collar was turned over and smoothed again and again and my golden curls twisted and arranged to make the most of me and last of all how i was cautioned not to be thinking of my clothes in truth i was in those days a very handsome youngster and it really is no more than justice to let the fact be known as there is nothing in my present appearance from which it could ever be inferred 
everybody in the house successively asked me if i should be a good boy and sit still and not talk nor laugh and my mother informed me in terrorem that there was a tithing man who carried off naughty children and shut them up in a dark place behind the pulpit and that this tithing man mr zephaniah scranton sat just where he could see me this fact impressed my mind with more solemnity than all the exhortations which had preceded it a proof of the efficacy of facts above reason under shadow and power of this weighty truth i demurely took hold of my mother's forefinger to walk to meeting the traveller in new england as he stands on some eminence and looks down on its rich landscape of golden grain and waving cornfield sees no feature more beautiful than its simple churches whose white taper fingers point upward amid the greenness and bloom of the distant prospects as if to remind one of the overshadowing providence whence all this luxuriant beauty flows and year by year as new ones are added to the number or succeed in the place of old ones there is discernible an evident improvement in their taste and architecture those modest doric little buildings with their white pillars green blinds and neat enclosures are very different affairs from those great uncouth mountains of windows and doors that stood in the same place years before to my childish eye however our old meeting-house was an awe-inspiring thing to me it seemed fashioned very nearly on the model of noah's ark and solomon's temple as set forth in the pictures in my scripture catechism pictures which i did not doubt were authentic copies and what more respectable and venerable architectural precedent could any one desire its double rows of windows of which i knew the number by heart its doors with great wooden quirls over them its belfry projecting out at the east end its steeple and bell all inspired as much sense of the sublime in me as strasburg cathedral itself and the inside was not a whit less imposing how magnificent to my eye seemed the turnip-like canopy that hung over the minister's head hooked by a long iron rod to the wall above and how apprehensively did i consider the question what would become of him if it should fall how did i wonder at the panels on either side of the pulpit in each of which was carved and painted a flaming red tulip bolt upright with its leaves projecting out at right angles and then at the grapevine bass relieved on the front with its exactly triangular bunches of grapes alternating at exact intervals with exactly triangular leaves to me it was an indisputable representation of how grapevines ought to look if they would only be straight and regular instead of curling and scrambling and twisting themselves into all sorts of slovenly shapes the area of the house was divided into large square pews boxed up with stout boards and surmounted with a kind of baluster work which i suppose to be provided for the special accommodation of us youngsters being the loopholes of retreat through which we gazed on the remarkabilia of the scene it was especially interesting to me to notice the coming into meeting of the congregation the doors were so contrived that on entering you stepped down instead of up 
a construction that has more than once led to unlucky results in the case of strangers i remember once when an unlucky frenchman entirely unsuspicious of the danger that awaited him made entrance by pitching devoutly upon his nose in the middle of the broad aisle that it took three bunches of my grandmother's fennel to bring my risibles into anything like composure such exhibitions fortunately for me were very rare but still i found great amusement in watching the distinctive and marked outlines of the various people that filled up the seats around me a yankee village presents a picture of the curiosities of every generation there from year to year they live on preserved by hard labour and regular habits exhibiting every peculiarity of manner and appearance as distinctly marked as when they first came from the mint of nature and as every body goes punctually to meeting the meeting-house becomes a sort of museum of antiquities a general muster-ground for past and present i remember still with what wondering admiration i used to look around on the people that surrounded our pew on one side there was an old captain mclean and major mcdill a couple whom the mischievous wits of the village designated as captain mclean and captain mcfat and in truth they were a perfect antithesis a living exemplification of flesh and spirit captain mclean was a mournful lengthy considerate-looking old gentleman with a long face digressing into a long thin horny nose which when he applied his pocket-handkerchief gave forth a melancholy minor keyed sound such as a ghost might make using a pocket-handkerchief in the long gallery of some old castle close at his side was the doughty puffing captain mcdill whose full-orbed jolly visage was illuminated by a most valiant red nose shaped something like an overgrown doughnut and looking as if it had been thrown at his face and happened to hit in the middle then there was old israel peters with a wooden leg which tramped into meeting with undeviating regularity ten minutes before meeting time and there was jedediah stebbins a thin wistful moonshiny looking old gentleman whose mouth appeared as if it had been gathered up with a needle and thread and whose eyes seemed as if they had been bound with red tape and there was old benaiah stevens who used regularly to get up and stand when the minister was about half through his sermon exhibiting his tall figure long single-breasted coat with buttons nearly as large as a tea-plate his large black horn spectacles stretched down on the extreme end of a very long nose and vigorously chewing meanwhile on the bunch of caraway which he always carried in one hand then there was aunt sally stimpson and old widow smith and a whole bevy of little dried old ladies with small straight black bonnets tight sleeves to the elbow long silk gloves and great fans big enough for a windmill and on a hot day it was a great amusement to me to watch the bobbing of the little black bonnets which showed that sleep had got the better of their owner's attention and the sputter and rustling of the fans when a more profound nod than common would suddenly wake them and set them to fanning and listening with redoubled devotion there was deacon dundas a great wagon load of an old gentleman whose ample pockets looked to me as if they might have held half the congregation who used to establish himself just on one side of me and seemed to feel such entire confidence in the soundness and capacity of his pastor that he could sleep very comfortably from one end of the sermon to the other occasionally to be sure one of your officious blue flies who as everybody knows are amazingly particular about such matters would buzz into his mouth 
or flirt into his ears a passing admonition as to the impropriety of sleeping in meeting when the good old gentleman would start open his eyes very wide and look about with a resolute air as much to say i wasn't asleep i can tell you and then setting himself in an edifying posture of attention you might perceive his head gradually settling back his mouth slowly opening wider and wider till the good man would go off again soundly asleep as if nothing had happened it was a good orthodox custom of old times to take every part of the domestic establishment to meeting even down to the faithful dog who as he had supervised the labours of the week also came with due particularity to supervise the worship of sunday i think i can see now the fitting out on a sunday morning the one wagon or two as the case might be tackled up with an old grey or an old bay with a buffalo skin over the seat by way of cushion and all the family in their sunday best packed in for meeting while master bowes watch or towser stood prepared to be an out guard and went meekly trotting up hill and down dale in the rear arrived at meeting the canine part of the establishment generally conducted themselves with great decorum lying down and going to sleep as decently as anybody present except when some of the business-loving blue-bottles aforesaid would make a sortie upon them when you might hear the snap of their jaws as they vainly sought to lay hold of the offender now and then between some of the sixthlies seventhlies and eighthlies you might hear some old patriarch giving himself a rousing shake and pit-patting soberly up the aisles as if to see that everything was going on properly after which he would lie down and compose himself to sleep again and certainly this was as improving a way of spending sunday as a good christian dog could desire but the glory of our meeting-house was its singer's seat that empyrean of those who rejoiced in the divine mysterious art of faso lying who by a distinguishing grace and privilege could raise and fall the cabalistical eight notes and move serene through the enchanted region of flats sharps thirds fifths and octaves there they sat in the gallery that lined three sides of the house treble counter tenor and bass each with its appropriate leaders and supporters there was generally seated the bloom of our young people sparkling modest and blushing girls on one side with their ribbons and finery making the place where they sat as blooming and lively as a flower garden and fiery forward confident young men on the other in spite of its being a meeting-house we could not swear that glances were never given and returned and that there was not often as much of an approach to flirtation as the distance and the sobriety of the place would admit certain it was that there was no place where our village coquettes attracted half so many eyes or led astray half so many hearts but i have been talking of singers all this time and neglected to mention the magnus apollo of the whole concern the redoubtable chorister who occupied the seat of honour in the midst of the middle gallery and exactly opposite to the minister certain it is that the good man if he were alive would never believe it for no person ever more magnified his office or had a more thorough belief in his own greatness and supremacy than zedekiah morse methinks i can see him now as he appeared to my eyes on that first sunday when he shot up from behind the gallery as if he had been sent up by a spring he was a little man whose fiery red hair brushed straight up on the top of his head had an appearance as vigorous and lively as real flame and this added to the ardour and determination of all his motions had obtained for him the surname of the burning bush 
he seemed possessed with the very soul of song and from the moment he began to sing looked alive all over till it seemed to me that his whole body would follow his hair upwards fairly rapt away by the power of harmony with what an air did he sound the important fa so la in the ears of the waiting gallery who stood with open mouths ready to seize their pitch preparatory to their general set to how did his ascending and descending arm astonish the zephyrs when once he laid himself out to the important work of beating time how did his little head whisk from side to side as now he beat and roared towards the ladies on his right and now towards the gentlemen on his left it used to seem to my astonished vision as if his form grew taller his arm longer his hair redder and his little green eyes brighter with every stave and particularly when he perceived any falling off of time or discrepancy in pitch with what redoubled vigour would he thump the gallery and roar at the delinquent quarter till every mother son and daughter of them skipped and scrambled into the right place again oh it was a fine thing to see the vigour and discipline with which he managed the business so that if on a hot drowsy sunday any part of the choir hung back or sung sleepily on the first part of a verse they were obliged to bestir themselves in good earnest and sing three times as fast in order to get through with the others caia morse was no advocate for your dozy drawling singing that one may do it leisure between sleeping and waking i assure you indeed he got entirely out of the graces of deacon dundas and one or two other portly leisurely old gentlemen below who had been used to throw back their heads shut up their eyes and take the comfort of the psalm by prolonging indefinitely all the notes the first sunday after caia took the music in hand the old deacon really rubbed his eyes and looked about him for the psalm was sung off before he was ready to get his mouth opened and he really looked upon it as a most irreverent piece of business but the glory of caius art consisted in the execution of those good old billowy compositions called fuguing tunes where the four parts that compose the choir take up the song and go racing around one after another each singing a different set of words till at length by some inexplicable magic they all come together again and sail smoothly out into a rolling sea of song i remember the wonder with which i used to look from side to side when treble tenor counter and bass were thus roaring and foaming and it verily seemed to me as if the psalm was going to pieces among the breakers and the delighted astonishment with which i found that each particular verse did emerge whole and uninjured from the storm but alas for the wonders of that old meeting-house how they are passed away even the venerable building itself has been pulled down and its fragments scattered yet still i retain enough of my childish feelings to wonder whether any little boy was gratified by the possession of those painted tulips and grapevines which my childish eye used to covet and about the obtaining of which in case the house should ever be pulled down i devised so many schemes during the long sermons and services of summer days I have visited the spot where it stood, but the modern, fair-looking building that stands in its room bears no trace of it, and of the various familiar faces that used to be seen inside, not one remains. Verily, I must be growing old, and as old people are apt to spin long stories, I check myself and lay down my pen." End of chapter 32
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. Chapter 33 The New Year's Gift of the Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Mayflower and Miscellaneous Writings, Chapter 33 The New Year's Gift. The sparkling ice and snow covered hill and valley. Tree and bush were glittering with diamonds. The broad, coarse rails of the fence shone like bars of solid silver while little fringes of icicles glittered between each bar in the yard of yonder dwelling the scarlet berries of the mountain ash shined through a transparent casing of crystal and the sable spruces and white pines powdered and glittering with the frost have assumed an icy brilliancy the eaves of the house the door knocker the pickets of the fence the honeysuckles and syringas once the boast of summer are all alike polished varnished and resplendent with their winter trappings now gleaming in the last rays of the early sunset within that large old-fashioned dwelling might you see an ample parlor all whose adjustments and arrangements speak of security warmth and home enjoyment of money spent not for show but for comfort thick crimson curtains descended in heavy folds over the embrasures of the windows and the ample hearth and wide fireplace speak of the customs of the good old times ere that gloomy unpoetic unsocial gnome the air-tight had monopolized the place of the blazing fireside no dark air-tight however filled our ancient chimney but there was a genuine old-fashioned fire of the most approved architecture with a gallant back-log and forestick supporting and keeping in order a crackling pile of dry wood that was whirring and blazing warm welcome for all whom it might concern occasionally bursting forth into most portentous and earnest snaps which rung through the room with a genuine hospitable emphasis as if the fire was enjoying himself and having a good time and wanted all hands to draw up and make themselves at home with him so looked that parlor to me when tired with a long day's ride i found my way into it just at evening and was greeted with a hearty welcome from my old friend colonel winthrop in addition to all that i have already described let the reader add if he pleases the vision of a wide and ample tea-table covered with a snowy cloth on which the servants are depositing the evening meal i had not seen winthrop for years but we were old college friends and i had gladly accepted an invitation to renew our ancient intimacy by passing the new year's season in his family i found him still the same hale kindly cheery fellow as in the days of old though time had taken the same liberty with his handsome head that jack frost had with the cedars and spruces out of doors in giving to it a graceful and becoming sprinkle of silver here you are my dear fellow said he shaking me by both hands just in season for the ham and chickens coffee all smoking my dear he added to a motherly looking woman who now entered here's john i beg pardon mr stewart as he spoke two bold handsome boys broke into the room accompanied by a huge newfoundland dog all as full of hilarity and abundant animation as an afternoon of glorious skating could have generated ha tom and ned you rogues you don't want any supper tonight, i suppose said the father gaily come up here and be introduced to my old friend here they come said he as one by one the opening doors admitted the various children to the summons of the evening meal here presenting a tall young girl is our eldest beginning to think herself a young lady on the strength of being fifteen years old and wearing her hair tucked up and here is eliza said he giving a pole to a blooming roguish girl of ten with large saucy black eyes and here is willie a bashful blushing little fellow in a check apron and now where's the little queen where's her majesty where's ally a golden head of curls was at this instant thrust timidly in at the door and i caught a passing glimpse of a pair of great blue eyes but the head curls eyes and all instantly vanished though a little fat dimpled hand was seen holding on to the door and swinging it back and forth 
Allie, dear, come in, said the mother in a tone of encouragement. Come in, Allie, come in, was repeated in various tones by each child. But Brother Tom pushed open the door, and taking the little recusant in his arms, brought her fairly in, and deposited her on her father's knee. She took firm hold of his coat, and then turned and gazed shyly upon me, her large splendid blue eyes gleaming through her golden curls. It was evident that this was the pet lamb of the fold, and she was just at that age when babyhood is verging into childhood, an age often indefinitely prolonged in a large family, where the universal admiration that waits on every look and motion and word of the baby and the multiplied monopolies and privileges of the baby estate seem by universal consent to extend as long and as far as possible and why not thus delay the little bark of the child among the flowery shores of its first eden defer them as we may the hard the real the cold commonplace of life comes all too soon this is our new year's gift said winthrop fondly caressing the curly head ally tell the gentleman how old you are i shall be four next new ears said the little one while all the circle looked applause ally tell the gentleman what you are said brother ned ally looked coquettishly at me as if she did not know whether she should favor me to that extent and the young princess was further solicited tell him what ally is said the oldest sister with a patronizing air papa's new ears present said my little lady at last and mamma's too said the mother gently amid the applauses of the admiring circle winthrop looked apologetically at me and said we all spoil her that's a fact and every one of us down to rover there who lets her tie tippets round his neck and put bonnets on his head and hug and kiss him to a degree that would disconcert any other dog in the world if ever beauty and poetic grace was an apology for spoiling it was in this case every turn of the bright head every change of the dimpled face and round and chubby limbs was a picture and within the little form was shrined a heart full of love and running over with compassion and good will for every breathing thing with feelings so sensitive that it was papa's delight to make her laugh and cry with stories and to watch in the blue earnest mirror of her eye every change and turn of his narration as he took her through long fairy tales and old-fashioned giant and ghost legends purely for his own amusement and much reprimanded all the way by mamma for filling the child's head with nonsense it was now however time to turn from the beauty to the substantial realities of the supper table i observed that ally's high chair was stationed close by her father's side and ever and anon while gaily talking he would slip into her rosy little mouth some choice bit from his plate these notices and attentions seeming so instinctive and habitual that they did not for a moment interrupt the thread of the conversation once or twice i caught a glimpse of rover's great rough nose turned anxiously up to the little chair whereat the small white hand forthwith slid something into his mouth though by what dexterity it ever came out from the great black jaws undevoured was a mystery when the supply of meat on the small lady's plate was exhausted i observed the little hand slyly slipping into her father's provision grounds and with infinite address abstracting small morsels where there was much mystery winking between the father and the other children and considerable tittering among the younger ones though all in marvellous silence as it was deemed best policy not to appear to notice ally's tricks lest they should become too obstreperous in the course of the next day i found myself to all intents and purposes as much part and parcel of the family as if i had been born and bred among them i found that i had come in a critical time when secrets were plenty as blackberries it being new year's week all the little hoarded resources of the children both of money and of ingenuity were in brisk requisition getting up new year's presents for each other and for father and mother the boys had their little tin savings banks where all the stray pennies of the year had been carefully hoarded all that had been got by blacking papa's boots or by piling wood or weeding the garden mingled with some fortunate additions which had come as windfalls from some liberal guest or friend all now were poured out daily on tables on chairs on stools and counted over with wonderful earnestness my friend though in easy circumstances was somewhat old-fashioned in his notions he never allowed his children spending money except such as they fairly earned by some exertions of their own let them do something he would say to make it fairly theirs and their generosity will then have some significance 
it is very easy for children to be generous on their parents' money. Great were the comparing of resources and estimates of property at this time. Tom and Ned, who were big enough to saw wood and hoe in the garden, had accumulated the vast sum of three dollars each, and walked about with their hands in their pockets and talked largely of purchases, like gentlemen of substance. They thought of getting Mama a new muff and Papa a writing desk, besides trinkets innumerable for sisters and a big doll for Allie. But after they had made one expedition to a neighboring town to inquire prices, I observed that their expectations were greatly moderated. As to little Willie, him of the checkered apron, his whole earthly substance amounted to thirty-seven cents. Yet there was not a member of the whole family circle, including the servants, that he could find it in his heart to leave out his remembrance. I ingratiated myself with him immediately, and twenty times a day did I count over his money to him, and did sums innumerable to show how much would be left over if he got this, that, or the other article, which he was longing to buy for father or mother. I proved to him most invaluable by helping him to think of certain small sixpenny and fourpenny articles that would be pretty to give to his sisters, making out with marbles for Tom and Ned and a very valiant-looking sugar horse for Allie. Miss Emma had the usual resource of young ladies, flosses, worsted, and knitting, and crochet needles, and busy fingers. And she was giving private lessons daily to Eliza to enable her to get up some napkin rings and bookmarks for the all-important occasion. A gentle air of bustle and mystery pervaded the whole circle. I was entrusted with so many secrets that I could scarcely make an observation or take a turn about the room without being implored to remember not to tell not to let papa know this or mamma that i was not to let papa know how the boys were going to buy him a new inkstand with a pen rack upon it which was entirely to outshine all previous inkstands nor tell mamma about the crochet bag that emma was knitting for her on all sides were mysterious whisperings and showing of things wrapped in brown paper glimpses of which through some inadvertence were always appearing to the public eye there were close councils held behind doors and in corners and suddenly broken off when some particular member of the family appeared there were flutters of vanishing bookmarks which were always whisked away when a door opened and incessant ejaculations of admiration and astonishment from one privileged looker or another on things which might not be mentioned to or be held by others papa and mamma behaved with the utmost circumspection and discretion and though surrounded on all sides by such pitfalls and labyrinths of mystery moved about with an air of the most unconscious simplicity possible but little ally from her privileged character became a very spoil sport in the proceedings her small fingers were always pulling open parcels prematurely or lifting pocket handkerchiefs ingenuously thrown down over mysterious articles and thus disconcerting the very profoundest surprises that were ever planned and were it not that she was still within the bounds of the kingly state of babyhood and therefore could be held to do no wrong she would certainly have fallen into general disgrace but then it was ally and that was apology for all things and the exploit was related in half whispers as so funny so cunning that miss curlypate was in no wise disconcerted at the headshakes and naughty alleys that visited her offences what dis said she one morning as she was rummaging over some packages indiscreetly left on the sofa oh emma see ally exclaimed eliza darting forward but too late for the flaxen curls and blue eyes of a wax doll had already appeared now she'll know all about it said eliza despairingly ally looked in astonishment as dolly's visage promptly disappeared from her view and then turned to pursue her business in another quarter of the room where spying something glittering under the sofa she forthwith pulled out and held up to public view a crochet bag sparkling with innumerable steel fringes oh what be dis she exclaimed again miss emma sprang to the rescue while all the other children with a burst of exclamations turned their eyes on mamma mamma very prudently did not turn her head and appeared to be lost in reflection though she must have been quite deaf not to have heard the loud whispers it's mamma's bag only think don't you think tom ally pulled out mamma's bag and held it right up before her don't you think she'll find out master tom valued himself greatly on the original and profound ways he had of adapting his presence to the tastes of the receiver without exciting suspicion for example 
he would come up into his mother's room all booted and coated for a ride to town jiggling his purse gleefully and begin mother mother which do you like best pink or blue that might depend on circumstances my son well but mother for a neck ribbon for example suppose somebody was going to buy you a neck ribbon why blue would be the most suitable for me i think well but mother which should you think was the best a neck ribbon or a book what book it would depend something on that why as good a book as a fellow could get for thirty-seven cents says tom well on the whole i think i should prefer the ribbon there ned says tom coming down the stairs i found out just what mother wants without telling her a word about it but the crowning mystery of all the great family arcana the thing that was going to astonish papa and mamma past all recovery was certain projected bookmarks that little Allie was going to be made to work for them this bold scheme was projected by miss emma and she had armed herself with the whole paper of sugar plums to be used as adjuvants to moral influence in case the discouragements of the undertaking should prove too much for Allie's patience as to Allie, she felt all the dignity of the enterprise her whole little soul was absorbed in it seated on emma's knee with the needle between her little fat fingers and holding the board very tight as if she was afraid it would run away from her she very gravely and carefully stuck the needle in every place but the right pricked her pretty little fingers ate sugar plums stopping now to pat rover and now to stroke pussy letting fall her thimble and bustling down to pick it up occasionally taking an episodical race around the room with rover during which time sister emma added a stitch or two to the work i would not wish to have been required in oath to give in my undisguised opinion as to the number of stitches the little one really put into her present but she had a most genuine and firm conviction that she worked every stitch of it herself and when on returning from a scamper with pussy she found one or two letters finished she never doubted that the whole was of her own execution and of course thought that working bookmarks was one of the most delightful occupations in the world it was all that her little heart could do to keep from papa and mamma the wonderful secret every evening she would bustle about her father with an air of such great mystery and seek to pique his curiosity by most skilful hints such as i know something but i sha'n't tell you not tell me oh ally why not oh it's about a new year's pez ally ally resounds from several voices don't you tell no i sha'n't but you're going to have a new year's peasant and so is mamma and you can't guess what it is can i no and i sha'n't tell you now ally said papa pretending to look aggrieved well it's going to be something worked ally be careful said emma yes i'll be very careful it's something real pretty something to put in a book you'll find out about it by and by i think i'm in a fair way too said father the conversation now digressed to other subjects and the nurse came in to take ally to bed who as she kissed her father in fullness of her heart added a fresh burst of information papa she said in an earnest whisper that fin is about so long measuring on her fat little arm a fin ally why you are not going to give me a fish are you i mean that thing said ally speaking the word with great effort and getting quite red in the face oh that thing i beg pardon my lady that puts another face on the communication said the father stroking her head fondly as he bade her good night the child can talk plainer than she does said the father but we are all so delighted with her little hottentot dialect that i don't know but she will keep it up till she is twenty it now wanted only three days of the new year when a sudden and deadly shadow fell on the dwelling late so busy and joyous a shadow from the grave and it fell on the flower of the garden the star the singing bird the loved and loving alley she was stricken down at once in the flush of her innocent enjoyment by a fever which from the first was ushered in with symptoms the most fearful all the bustle and preparation ceased the presents were forgotten or lay about unfinished as if no one now had a heart to put their hand to anything while up in her little crib lay the beloved one tossing and burning with restless fever and without power to recognize any of the loved faces that bent over her the doctor came twice a day with a heavy step and a face in which anxious care was too plainly written and while he was there each member of the circle hung with anxious imploring faces about him 
as if to entreat him to save their darling but still the deadly disease held on its relentless course in spite of all that could be done i thought myself prepared to meet god's will in any form it might come said winthrop to me but this one thing i had forgotten it never entered into my head that my little alley could die the evening before new year's the deadly disease seemed to be progressing more rapidly than ever and when the doctor came for his evening call he found all the family gathered in mournful stillness around the little crib i suppose said the father with an effort to speak calmly that this may be her last night with us the doctor made no answer and the whole circle of brothers and sisters broke out into bitter weeping it is just possible that she may live till to-morrow said the doctor to-morrow her birthday said the mother oh ally ally wearily passed the watches of that night each brother and sister had kissed the pale little cheek to bid farewell and gone to their rooms to sob themselves to sleep and the father and mother and doctor alone watched around the bed oh what a watch is that which despairing love keeps waiting for death poor rover the companion of ally's gayer hours resolutely refused to be excluded from the sick chamber stretched under the little crib he watched with unsleeping eyes every motion of the attendants and as often as they rose to administer medicine or change the pillow or bathe the head he would rise also and look anxiously over the side of the crib as if he understood all that was passing about an hour past midnight the child began to change her moans became fainter and fainter her restless movements ceased and a deep and heavy sleep settled upon her the parents looked wistfully on the doctor it is the last change he said she will probably pass away before the daybreak heavier and deeper grew that sleep and to the eye of the anxious watchers the little face grew paler and paler yet by degrees the breathing became regular and easy and a gentle moisture began to diffuse itself over the whole surface a new hope began to dawn on the minds of the parents as they pointed out these symptoms to the doctor all things are possible with god said he in answer to the inquiring looks he met it may be that she will yet live an hour more passed and the rosy glow of the new year's morning began to blush over the snowy whiteness of the landscape far off from the window could be seen the kindling glow of a glorious sunrise looking all the brighter for the dark pines that half veiled it from view and now a straight and glittering beam shot from the east into the still chamber it fell on the golden hair and pale brow of the child lighting it up as if an angel had smiled on it and slowly the large blue eyes unclosed and gazed dreamily around ally ally said the father bending over her trembling with excitement you're going to have a new year's present whispered the little one faintly smiling i believe from my heart that you are sir said the doctor who stood with his fingers on her pulse she has passed through the crisis of the disease and we may hope a few hours turned this hope to glad certainty for with the elastic rapidity of infant life the signs of returning vigor began to multiply and ere evening the little one was lying in her father's arms answering with languid smiles to the overflowing proofs of tenderness which every member of the family was showering upon her see my children said the father gently this dear one is our new year's present what can we render to god in return End of chapter thirty three the new year's gift